but which they mean centers of expertise and skills which see themselves as part of the solution, not part of the problem. And the centers who are accountable to their own standards without necessarily thinking of the wider system. There have to be hubs, as I argue, but there don't need to be too many of them. Spike Mulligan, British comedian, expert for this for my talk, invented a machine that did the work of two men but required three men to work it. Well, there's uh, a true word spoken in jest. Uh, the proliferation of expertise within health systems is akin to three men being charged with doing the work of two. In the future, we're going to have to design mach machines that do the work of two men that take one man to work. The experience of patients is one of fragmentation, uh, either in the consultation, which doesn't address all the problems, discontinuity, lack of coordination, gaps in coverage. That's the fragmentation package. I'm going to be talking a lot in this talk about general practice or family medicine, as you might call it, uh, not because of the intrinsic worthiness or goodness or brilliance of family doctors. Um, that's not my argument at all. Uh, it is that the system, certainly in the UK, perhaps here, has built into it features of contact, coverage, continuity, coordination, flexibility, and long term relationships. It's got all those things in a sustainable, affordable <coughs> way. And the reason I spend a lot of time concentrating on this is it's also a source of power in the system that is generally poorly coordinated and poorly connected with other sources of power. And to put it bluntly, we're missing a trick in not capitalizing on the coverage that we already have within the system to recognize that the coverage isn't cold calling like screening where you bring somebody up and, and ask them to do something. It's when they come with a problem and you deal with the problem and then you get the opportunity to do something else. So that determines what's possible. And of course there are public health policies that don't require contact with the public. And I mentioned in some relation to MCPs. And there are some of them that require single contacts, like immunization some kinds of screening. But there are other types of public health policy that require serial contact over a period of time. And we don't need to invent that because we've got it with the primary care. We just need to make better use of it. Uh, that's necessary but not sufficient. Because doctors and patients or nurses and patients on their own lack of time and resources that are available with all of these other resources which they need to be better linked to, whether it's health improvement, other areas of primary care, secondary care, local authority, the law of the sector. There's no end of people with whom there needs to be better relationships. Uh, but I think because family medicine has got the intrinsic features of contact coverage, continuity, comprehensiveness, coordination, flexibility, relationships, trust, and sometimes leadership. It's a natural hub around which these other resources and the rest should be configured. That's one of my arguments. We need a machine that does the work of two men and takes one man to work it, so it's not going to be high technology. Uh, this is fanciful, but we need something of a pioneering nature to take hubs and grips and spokes and wheels and axles to transport the system that we've got to the one that we need. I want to say some things about Barbara Stanfield, the latest Barbara Stanfield, who's really led the global understanding of primary care, the time to discuss contact, continuity, comprehensiveness, and coordination. Um, her four criteria doesn't include gatekeeping. This is a gatekeeper and butterfly. And there's a lot of gatekeeper butterfly, but there is so called, they used to talk about gates uh, near hedgerows in olden times. Uh, gatekeeping is very important. It makes health systems efficient. 
by acting in a break in contact with specialist services. And the interesting thing about it is that in the UK, the ratio is something like 87 percent of contacts in primary care, 50 percent in hospital. Well, if it shifted one percent to 86, 14, it would be 10 percent of all in the primary care, but it would bring the hospital to its means. So we're very dependent on that ratio. It's very important. It makes health services efficient, using better outcomes at lower costs. And the interesting thing about it is it's not achieved by guidelines or evidence. It's generally achieved by pragmatic and conscientious decision making about what people need. And it gives us these benefits. And there might be something in that to return to. So Starfield's <coughs> four criteria need to be complemented by the increasing focus nowadays on coverage, measuring what we have done and closing the gap, and on quality based on audit and evidence. It's coverage and quality that make primary care make a difference. And also, when we do that inequitably, we produce inequality. Now, the pioneer in addressing those issues uh, the rule of halves, the extent to which things are not done, people not diagnosed, not treated, not followed up, not getting the goods, the, the intrinsic leakiness of health systems. And uh, we had a conference on this in, in Sydney last uh, September on bridging the gaps. It was funded by the Hypertension Society. We had to concentrate to begin with on hypertension. And what the meeting wasn't really about that. We did talk about bridging the gaps in coverage in continuity and in quality. Following the example of the Tudor Hart in South Wales, the mining village, uh, he had an interesting story. He, he began working with Archie Cochrane of the Cochrane Collaboration fame as an MRC epidemiologist in South Wales, studying populations and getting 90 percent response rates. And in doing so in the 50s, he saw a lot of frank illness, which as a researcher he wasn't able to do anything about. And in his own part, so he left. He left to work in his own village to apply an epidemiological approach to health care. He called that uh, leaving a life of facts for a life addressing the facts of, of life. Uh, this simple idea of applying epidemiology to clinical care. He was the first man in the world to measure the blood pressure of all his patients. And at that time,
moving the patient center of medicine. They're thinking about continuity, integration, a population approach, increasingly applying outcomes where it existed, and community, ideas of local democracy. Top of, the, top of this list, we've really got orthodoxy. Everyone agrees with that. The bottom of the list, in terms of democracy, then uh, we're in a much earlier stage. I want to say something about the randomized controlled trials. The gold standard of evidence in order to eliminate bias. So how ironic it is that evidence-based medicine when collated in guidelines is a monument to bias. 